as Mark said, uh, I'm Mike Schaefer. Glad to be here and to, to be invited to speak here. I'm a professor of science communication at the University of Zurich. And by training, I'm a, I'm a communication scientist. So I'm representing a discipline that historically has dealt with public communication in, in any way and with the different facets that it had. So uh, how do stakeholders try to communicate, strategically communicate, use PR, use marketing, etc., to get their views about certain things out in the public? How does the public discuss this in media reporting, in, in online media, in social media, etc.? Who is actually seeing, using, listening to, uh, 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 reading that? And what are the effects of that? in the end, on people's knowledge, on people's attitudes, on people's behavior, potentially. So that's kind of the broad context of the discipline that I'm, that I'm uh, coming from and working in. And the uh, specific focus that I have is science communication, more generally. So you will have a number of examples that come from one of the topics I've worked on quite often, which is climate change communication, and which I hope will be appropriate for the Environmental Change Institute. But uh, it's not all about climate change and the link to the Anthropocene. I, maybe we can try to find this then in the, in the Q&A afterwards. Just one more thing before I start the uh, slides. If you're interested uh, on SlideShare, and if you use Twitter, you'll find the link there. And otherwise, you can, you can search for them on SlideShare, and you will have the slides all there. So what I want to do is these three steps that you see there. First of all, I want to introduce you to uh, what I've called here, what others have called actually, I'm just, yeah, just using this label, the science of science communication. So what is the specific per, uh, uh, rationale and perspective of the science of science communication, first of all? Then I'm going to take, uh, in broad strokes mostly, I'm going to take some of the central findings of the science of science communication, which describe changes in the science communication ecosystem in the communication landscape about science communication, and I'm going to present you what's going on there. And in the third part, then, I'm going to deduce a number of challenges that result from these changes that we see, and maybe also a number of potential responses, and afterwards we have some time for Q&A and potentially the wine reception <laughs> that, that we're all here for. So, first part, the perspective of the science of science communication. I mean, the, the general background probably is that science communication has become more important in recent years. Um, and specifically so now that in a lot of realms of society people are talking about fake news and alternative facts and scientists, scholars, people in science politics are concerned about trust in science potentially eroding and uh, the situation of science in society potentially getting more problematic. And against this backdrop, uh, a number of institutions have been calling for more science communication, like a number of, of uh, scientific academies. The Royal Society is very active here. The ALIA, who has done working groups, etc., on science communication, is kind of the umbrella organization of the European scientific academies. You have this uh, uh, the AAAS, and the US is doing a lot of seminars and webinars on science you have the seminar at the, the Secular Colloquia of the National Academies uh, of the Sciences in, in the US, which are a great resource if you're interested in the science of science communication. You have things like the March for Science movement, you have journalistic articles from The Guardian or blog posts, all discussing and calling for science communication. So that's the general backdrop for the science of science communication. And the science of science communication, which has emerged then Kind of the, the, and the term actually comes from Baro Fischhoff and, and Dietram Schäufele uh, from the US. Um, the basic rationale behind that, and a little bit my professional mantra also, if you like, is the, is the, the, the acknowledgement that well, behind some, when we do science communication, our assumption is that scientific knowledge can make a valuable contribution to society, uh, to, to decisions that individuals, organizations, or societies as such uh, uh, to decisions that they that they that they do. Um, so we actually want evidence-based decisions in society, evidence, evidence, scientific evidence out there in society. And if that's the underlying rationale of science communication, then we should do science communication in the same way. We need a science of science communication that actually figures out well what's working, whom do we actually reach if we do certain kinds of science communication. 
what target groups can we actually reach, what aims can we accomplish among these target groups, etc. So we need something like evidence-based science communication, and that's the aim and the rationale of the science of science communication as a research field that has uh, uh, mushroomed in recent years. So it's, uh, the field is institutionalizing, there's more chairs, meaning professorships, there's professional associations devoted to science communication, there's specific journals like science communication itself or, or public understanding of science, there's a number of introductory encyclopedias or textbooks, the Routledge Handbook, the Oxford Handbook on the Science of Science Communication, something we have done in Germany, so resources are popping up. If you look at meta-analyses, you see that, that the number of scholarly publications on science communication have gone up, there's more out there. Uh, but one thing, or two things actually, you have to keep in mind when I keep talking and try to present you a number of results now, is that studies of science communication have two central biases. Uh, one is that we almost exclusively analyze the sciences, the natural sciences. So most of the research focuses on, on natural science, not on the humanities, not on arts. And another bias is that most of what we know about science communication, from a scholarly perspective, from an analytical perspective, actually we know about Western countries, and more specifically, mostly about Anglophone countries. So more than half of the papers that are out there about the science of science communication actually concern the UK and the US. And that is similar, by the way, if you look at climate change communication. It's also, it's mostly Western, mostly Anglophone countries. For example, about countries in the global south who are often the most vulnerable to climate change, we know extremely little from scholarly analysis. Okay, and the kind of the understanding of science communication that you find in this field is a very broad, <coughs> a very broad one. So it's essentially, I think the, 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 the implicit definition that you find in the field is that they understand that science communication, all communication from within science and in society about science including a diverse set of communicators, a diverse set of content, including the uses and the effects of this communication. And this includes communication from individual scientists via social media, this includes strategic communication of scientific institutions, this includes communication about scientific issues from NGOs, for example, or from corporations, this includes science journalism, of course, in its various forms and ways. This also includes fictional content, which influences the way people think about science, or where they get in contact with science, with forensics, for example, or with physics. And it also includes, of course, museums and public talks, etc. So it's a broad understanding of science. And it, it's not only a broad understanding in the terms, in terms of the channels and the forms of science communication we look at, it's also a broad understanding in terms of the communicative aims or the models of science communication that are associated with, with what people are doing. So that, that's not all the aims that are out there for science communication, but uh, three, I think, are the most probably important ones, the ones that, is, that are most talked about and the ones where pretty elaborate models are available to, to analyze them and behind them. The one is what I've called here knowledge transfer as an aim, where the rationale essentially is, well, science produces the best available knowledge for many societal decisions, so we have to get it out there. And that was the driving force for what, what has been call, uh, called in the 80s and 90s the public understanding of science, the public understanding of science and humanities, knowledge transfer to the public. But that also partly because people have realized, well, that is limited in what it can do, actually, this approach, and we, can, we will get back to that later has been complemented by approaches looking for more particip participatory, biological forms of science communication, where you actually want citizens and scientists to meet more eye to eye, to have an actual dialogue. So uh, not just one directional, but, but two directional. Under labels like public engagement, public participation, and in forms like consensus conferences or citizen science. And in recent years, this has been again complemented by a third aim, uh, which is the legitimation of science, of the scientific system, of scientific institutions, of disciplines, of research fields. Uh, a communication that via often strategic communication, <coughs> via marketing, via PR, 
tries to ensure what has been called the license to operate for the system. And I think if you look at the channels that I've just presented you of science communication, you can all you could all map them in this triangle that I have here, and none of them would only tick one of the boxes or be on the on the extreme in one corner. They all kind of cater towards several of these angles. Okay, so so much for the science of science communication. And as I said, research has mushrooms, and there's quite a bit of of research out there with a variety of findings and with taken from these findings, I thought, I would, I would uh, try to describe what I've called the changes in the science communication ecosystem as they have been described by, by uh, the scholars from the field. Um, and the background against here is that in the last 10, 15 years, something has been occurring, what a colleague has been calling the, the a tectonic transformation of science, in science communication, in the ecosystem around science communication. And three facets of that are, I think, the most important. Three facets uh, that are interrelated with one another. That's what this circle and the interconnected arrows are trying to uh, communicate to you. Three facets that, that where it's not quite clear which one is the cause for the others, they actually they co-evolve, in a sense. And what I would like to do in the second part is actually go through these three facets with you and give you an idea what they're all about. And the first one is, well, we have worsening conditions for science journalism. And this is connected very broadly and only very shortly to essentially graphs like this, which you can show for practically every country, at least in the Western world. That's circulation numbers for newspapers in the UK over the last uh, about 10 years, nine years, based on ABC and Ofcom data. And what you see here is the total number of uh, circulation of papers sold, if you like, in millions. So it was 22 millions almost in 2010, and that has halved in the last 10 years. And that is a trend if you look at individual newspapers here, from the Sun over the Daily Mail to the Sunday Times and the Times itself and all that. The circulation numbers go down everywhere. And that's the annual change, actually. That's not the 10-year change, that's the annual change over one year from 2018 to 2019. So that's quite significant. And you have this everywhere. And what happens is uh, that the model of legacy journalism, of legacy news media is under pressure. What's happening is uh, their revenue is going down. Revenue is actually moving towards the big tech platforms, mostly towards Facebook, towards Google. So what they have to do is cost-cutting, outsourcing, short-term contracting, having more journalists as freelancers, ever quicker production cycles. So the working conditions are actually worsening in many of these media. And this actually affects uh, specialist beats and beats like science journalism uh, particularly hardly. Because they are seen in many media houses as, quote there, as a luxury increasingly difficult to justify with other types of news will be cheaper to produce and more popular with audiences, and thus with advertisers. So if you look at uh, <coughs> science beats across different media, or the number of science journalists in different media, you see a significant decrease in the number of people working in these beats, and in the number of these beats themselves. Um, ah, I'll, I'll wait. One study from the US was quite quite striking in that respect. It was Sharon Dunwoody who had analyzed the number of science beats in US media in the 19, in the late 80s, I think. Um, and there were about 90, 95 science beats in American, uh, American news media. 50, uh, 20 years later, 20 years later, no, it's not true, 25 years later, how many of these 95 science beats do you think were still in existence? Close 19. So less than a quarter of them were still there. And you have this in, in, in many, many places. And what happens is two things then for journalists. One, a lot of what you read about science issues is actually not written by experts, or at least not experts from the, for the scientific side of things. So a lot of what you read about new technologies, about complex scientific issues and all that, is not written and cannot be written anymore due to the resource situation 
by expert journalists who are actually experts for this topic. And what happens, uh, the second thing that happens is the, the working conditions for the remaining journalists that are still there, that still with science journalists, worsen and worsen considerably. And what that's, for example, something we have done for Switzerland, uh, a survey of science journalists in Switzerland where we try to figure out, well, how do they describe their working conditions? And the things they have answered uh, in our survey are not only indicative for their working situation, you find, and you, and you actually have similar surveys in other countries, and you find the same trends in many, many countries, including the, UA, uh, the UK. They have to produce more. They have to produce more articles because there's fewer people actually manning these, these desks. They, have, they also have to produce for more formats. 20 years ago, you essentially, if you were working in a newspaper, for example, you had to write your newspaper article, give it a headline, give it a picture, maybe that was that. Now, you have to write for the paper. There has to be an online <coughs> version. There has to be a Twitter blur, potentially. There has to be something for other social media. And you have to curate many different things. You have to, so you have to do more, and you have to do more with more insecure and fewer financial resources with fewer people with less time. And that is, that is difficult, as you can imagine. And what this says for the quality of journalism potentially you can measure. So, yes? Why do you think it's good um, Because lots of journalists that I know have greater job security than many other countries and much better work conditions. I, I only picked uh, Switzerland because I come from Switzerland. This is actually <laughs> something we have done. <laughs> and as I promised to splice in a little bit of my stuff. But there's the um, um, the UK study actually that looks similar and that also exists uh, was done by um, Andrew Williams. So there's, there's very, very similar numbers actually for the, for the UK. I have to have some Switzerland. Okay. Um, and what's happening based on that, on this worsening situation now, and again in many countries, is that there's a search for sustainable business models. Sustainable business models meaning business models that ensure financial sustainability, while at the same time ensure something like uh, uh, editorial independence. So that you're not on the, on the financial leash of some, of some funder. These are some of the models, some you potentially know. Who, who of you actually knows the science media centers or the science media center? That is, that is one of the models, but very, very shortly and very, very crudely. The idea is that the science media center actually collects the raw material for media coverage, quotes, infographs, uh, info sheets and all that, and provides them free of charge to uh, journalists all across the country. So they can actually write their, their pieces or, or do their news pieces uh, based on this raw material that they themselves don't have to research anymore. Um, and that is, I'm actually not quite sure about the UK and Germany, where it also exists in Australia, it's foundation fund, it's foundation money, so it's philanthropic money. Inside Climate News uh, is, is another example where you have, you have uh, private money, foundation money going in there. Substance, again, an example from the German-speaking world, tried crowdfunding to uh, use that for science journalism. Got, uh, got started, so to speak, but after one and a half years had to close down again because they couldn't sustain the, the crowdfunding money coming in. The conversation is also a model that exists in the UK uh, and many other countries by now and has kind of a similar model like the Science Media Center. We can discuss the differences later if you're interested. Yeah. You have to know how well the Guardian's model of financing is done because they recently switched to that on their online presence. So where, like, every time you go on, there's a small advert that says support independent journalism. Uh, in response to losing, uh, I have to earn my wine here, I know, but actually I could easily pass this question on to James, <laughs> because James will know much better than I do. Right? Do you, James? Well, the first time last year, the, the Guardian went to bring in, so the model of getting money is actually, you know, sort of asking the things to pay actually works. The problem is how you sustain, how many times do you go back to the movements and ask them, but it's, it's actually been very, very successful. The Guardian, currently produce about 30, 40, 50 million pounds a year. And it's funded by trust, for the first time they said they are breaking the market. All right, and this again, two Swiss models that are interesting potentially, which is one, the, the 20 minutes you may not, or I guess you may actually know, but uh, 
is a free newspaper that has a huge circulation in Switzerland, reaches 2 million Swiss people out of the 8 million Swiss people that there are, but normally don't have a science section. So what two foundations actually did is, for a five-year period of time, they uh, hired an agency and told them, well, look, you produce two science pages for 20 Minuten. We pay for that. You deliver it to 20 Minuten free of charge, uh, readily layout it. Uh, they only had to essentially copy and paste it into their newspaper and print it. So that was there, and that was interesting for the foundation because in this way you can reach a very, very broad and very diverse audience. But when the, when the foundation said, but we won't do this forever, and now the newspaper would have to take over at some stage, they essentially stopped it. Or they, they're doing it on, on, on a very low level now, and they will stop it soon. So that was not sustainable as well. And the other thing is that the, the, the final model that I have for you, the SDA is the news agency in Switzerland. And scientific organizations, the academies, the general funder, which is something like the National Science Foundation of Switzerland, they fund two positions. Uh, two journalist positions at the news agency doing science journalism there, which is then supposed to trickle down into uh, the coverage of a lot of other media. So, so much for the first step of this, of this cycle. <coughs> the second one is this one there, the pluralization of public science communication. There is a little bit of a void because science journalism is in crisis. And this void has created opportunities for those in public, government, agencies, companies, and others to take their messages to the public, and particularly <coughs> so, of course, because they now have social media at their disposal and online media and mobile, mobile media at their disposal. So it's easier also to use these media to actually uh, communicate to the outside. This has, this has led to more and also more diverse voices being out there in public when it comes to many, many scientific issues. And sometimes these are voices where, from a scientific perspective, you would actually, that, that you would like to have out there, like pro-vaccination campaigns that are, that are funded by health insurances, for example, or pro-environmental campaigns. But that also means that corporations, for example, have a different pathway and an easier way to actually get their messages directly to the public, bypassing the gatekeepers that have been there quite a while. And that also means that messages uh, can get to the public, but you're probably not too keen on them actually getting out there and not dominating the public debate. So there's a pluralization. There's a pluralization of voices, of content, and also of the quality of content that we have there. Um, and it's not only true for players and actors and stakeholders outside science, science and scientific institutions also play a role there. If you look at institutional science communication, university communication, university PR, university marketing, etc., that has uh, in recent years intensified strongly, has been professionalized strongly, and has become strongly more strategic in a way that deviates from, from earlier, earlier kinds of science communication. I just had a question about, um, it, I, this would be a big task and I don't think it would be um, financially viable, but is there any institution or body or maybe a university that looks at these independent science communication and, and uh, evaluates based on truth? Because I've got corporations that also you're saying like GMO is killing our children. Is there any neutral body that, that debunks um, science communication or plays that kind of role? Uh, you know, yes and no, kind of. I mean, usually it's topical. So for example, in the climate change communication field or climate change, climate science field, there's a number of, of fact-checking sites, for example, debunking sites that try to do that, sometimes specifically focusing on actual communication campaigns that are out there, sometimes more generally addressing the, 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 the main arguments, for example, that climate skeptics would put out there. You have this also in the health field or on vaccination, for example. And you have a couple of trials to actually establish something like that uh, together with computer scientists on a more, uh, on a larger scale, actually linking output in a media output that is in, in some way based on some scientific article to these scientific publications 
and then comparing the two with one another. And they're playing around with the question, well, can we automate this? Is it really possible to assess quality? What aspects at least, of quality in an automated way? <laughs> Difficult. And or combining this with essentially with peer judgments. But if you want peer judgments, of course, it immediately gets slower. And you actually need peers doing that, and it gets, gets more difficult. But that, that's, that's a huge question, actually, in the field. Uh, but one where we only have solutions on a very small, small scale and very specific topics. What I wanted to show you here about university communication is that um, in a situation where science journalism is eroding, universities actually are in an arms race with one another and are actually in a situation where their communication is becoming much stronger, much more professional, and much more strategic. So if you, if you look at the resources that they have, again, Swiss examples, the number of people working in Swiss, uh, that's, that's taken from uh, two or uh, three, I think, three uh, universities in Switzerland. And, uh, what Stefan Rosmol, a colleague there, has done is simply counting the number of people working in the media departments. You can see that this has increased uh, strongly. If you look at output, it's scientific in, uh, organizations in, in Germany. If you look at output, media releases, press releases, <coughs> online communication, all that, you can see that this has been uh, uh, going up strongly as well. And if you do qualitative interviews, qualitative studies, trying to map how things have changed, how outside communication and the standing of outside communication has changed in scientific organizations, then people uh, tell you also that, well, and that's a statement from a, from a communications director in, uh, in one of the Max Planck institutions, so one of the biggest scientific uh, organizations in Germany. And she says, well, in recent years, and that's something you get a lot, my position has gotten more and more important in the institute. I'm part of all board meetings and of all uh, decisions. So I'm considered public interest represented through me, through the communications director, is considered in board decisions quite often. And that's happening a lot. And the third uh, uh, part of this, of this uh, uh, cycle that you have there is the digitalization of science communication. So the general trend very quickly is, of course, we have rising internet penetration actually uh, uh, reaching, reaching a ceiling level now in countries like the UK, certainly. And the first contact with news generally is increasingly online, increasingly actually on the smartphone. That's data from the Reuters Institute, where I'm, where I'm currently situated, where you see that for quite a few countries, the number of people that get news first online uh, on their mobile phone is increasing strongly, as you, as you would expect. And also for science, uh, that's actually that's, that's these two graphs here, for science and technology issues or for specific scientific issues, internet sources are the most important ones for many people, where they actually get their information about science from. That's figures from the US. Um, so online media are more important. Social media are more important. Uh, mobile media are more important. And on the one hand, this gives people a lot of opportunities and a lot of, of uh, uh, chances to improve science communication. It could be, as Matt Nisbet has called it, the golden age of popularization because people who are interested, highly motivated individuals, <coughs> have great chances to find an amount of information about any given scientific topic that was not available to them or only with many more difference, uh, difficulties available to them uh, uh, a couple of decades ago. So you can communicate extensively, multimodally, interactively, you can target actual user groups and use online media to do that. And there's a number of quite good examples. So there's the, who of you knows the uh, Global Warming Six America studies from, from Yale University? It's the, uh, that's, thank you. That's uh, a study where the colleagues from Yale University and from George Mason University try to figure out and map different groups within the American population that have different attitudes towards climate change. From people who are very concerned and activists all the way to people who are disengaged or actually don't believe in climate change. And what they did then is try to use this logic and apply it to micro-target or to meso-target maybe 
uh, people on Facebook. So they asked people to take a very, very short survey to actually categorize them in one of these six attitude groups. And afterwards, they would get targeted information about events, about things they could do about climate change uh, on, on Facebook. So you had this, not on an individual level, but on the segment level, that's maybe more meso-targeting than micro-targeting, you try to use online media to do that. There's good examples, I have to hurry up a bit, um, good examples for uh, online fora where you actually have tried to uh, promote constructive deliberations about scientific issues, or in this case about environmental uh, 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 or agricultural, actually agricultural policy in the US. You have, who of you knows Hashem Agayi? That's the, nobody does, the, the science superstar. <laughs> The Pew Research Center in the US, two years back, I think, had a report out called the, the Science People See on Social Media, or something very similar to that. And what they did is mapping how science is presented on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, etc. And among them, they had a list of the 10 most used resources on uh, Facebook, for science, for science communicators on Facebook. And there was that, you probably know, I've talked about yeah. science. That was among them. Hashim Agayi is, I think, seventh or something, 30 million followers on Facebook for videos about science, mostly in the Arab world, actually. But he's hugely influential. And if you look at that, he's doing short videos, explanatory videos, very immersive videos, very successfully communicating science and using the, the affordances that you have in this media to communicate science. Uh, and you have things like the March for Science, which, is, which was actually a social media product initiated by a Reddit post, and then social media were largely used to actually mobilize people to attend the march for science. So there's good examples, but there's also downsides, which we will get to in a second. Uh, so that's kind of, I think, the major changes that we have in science communication, on the science communication ecosystem. And in the last part, I would like to describe a couple of challenges that are resulting from that and maybe uh, a number of responses that are out there and uh, that we can discuss later on. So the first and uh, 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 very prominent challenge is that many people actually assume that pub public attitudes towards science may get worse because we have less science journalism, we have less explanations out there, we have more people with different views on science, pseudoscience, anti-science, that have opportunities to easier reach a broader public. So the assumption is that, well, a lot of, of problematic content may get out there about scientific issues, public attitudes towards science, trust in science may actually get worse, may erode. So far, however, we don't really see that, at least not if we look at survey data in quite a number of countries, actually. The longest timeline is this one that we have from the US. That's taken from the science and engineering indicators, kind of a biannual assessment of the state of science in the US. <coughs> and what's in there, among other things, is survey data on the Americans' attitudes towards science. So from the 70s, 73 to 1980, uh, to 2018, you have no decline in trust in science. It's pretty stable over time. What you, and I haven't mapped this here because that would have been too confusing, if, but if you actually look at other fields of science, trust is going down. Trust in the media is going down. Trust in the press is going down. Trust in politics, trust in churches. It's all, that's all going down. Same data, same questions. Trust in science is quite stable. There's only one field actually of society where trust is going up all the time, which, which is that in the US? Celebrity. Not, oh, not celebrity. I don't think they ask for celebrity. <laughs> The military. The, the military is actually going up. Uh, but that's the only one. All the others are going down except science. Science is stable. Yes? Why was trust so high in like 1975? Here? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, no, I, I, I don't know. Sorry. Um, 
There's similar data for the UK, actually. Ipsos Mori does this. The timeline is not quite as long. It's, it's the 80s until now. But, and there's science, starting on the year from, the, from, from 96. But trust in science has actually not gone down in the UK. It may even have gone up. So the, the, there's broadly positive attitudes, rather than the peak commentary associated with the post-truth era was, the, was kind of the, 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 the uh, uh, final finding of a, of a recent kind of meta piece that, that came out. And if you look, or try to look, on a more global scale, the Wellcome Trust actually had uh, a study out um, last year where they did a survey in 140 countries in a, a bit sim more simple form, but where they try to assess trust in science in these 140 countries, they again find that overall global trust in doctors, nurses, and scientists is rather high in many countries. So we don't see this trust, this loss of trust in science yet, at least. What we do see, though, or potentially see, is differences between different groups of the population in their trust in science. Uh, and that's kind of my second challenge, or my second, my second uh, uh, potential result from these changes that I've described here. Audiences may become more individualized and fragmented. Uh, and uh, the background is that, well, people are nowadays able to select their own media diets more easily than they were a couple of years back, so you can actually decide what you want to, to uh, uh, look at on, a, on the website of a medium, or you can design your own Facebook timeline or Twitter feed or whatever or Instagram feed in the way that you like to. And potentially these preferences that you have there in actually designing your own feeds are algorithmically reinforced by the platforms themselves. Because they want you to stay on the platform so they actually tend to uh, uh, or could potentially tend to reinforce your interests by showing you content that's similar to the one that you have chosen before or that people who the algorithm thinks are similar like you have chosen before. And now we have to say that research actually shows, and that's among that is research from the Reuters Institute here in, in Oxford, research actually shows that for many issues, and for example for political issues, these echo chambers, people selecting their own media bias and remaining in, in, in kind of their own echo chamber where they only see and hear what they have thought before anyway. Or these filter bubbles, this reinforcement of, of, uh, of people's attitudes via algorithmic curation, that they're not as pronounced as we would have expected. That social media can actually have a, an, a positive effect on media diets because they diversify what people see and also the viewpoints that people see in social media. But there's at least a number of studies in science communication for vaccination, for example, and for climate change that have shown that for these issues, complex specialized issues, sometimes quite far detached from people's life worlds, that these fragmentations of the public may be more pronounced around these issues than they are potentially around other issues. And what we've done in, in Switzerland, what we regularly do actually, is a survey, the Science Barometer Switzerland, a so regular survey where we assess what the Swiss think about science and research. And what we also do based on the data that we get there is we try to map the Swiss population with regards to the attitudes that they have towards science and research. And uh, based on these statistical uh, analyses that we do, what we, what we uh, have found are these four broad segments of the Swiss population that differ in their attitudes towards science. So you have the science fund, who make up about a quarter of the Swiss population with a rather high interest in science, with high trust in science. Uh, you have the critically interested, also with a high interest in science. The trust issue is a bit different here because they have a high trust in the system of science. They think the scientific method is the best way to actually find out things about the world. But they have much less uh, uh, trust in, how, how should I put that, in the way how science is actually done. So they have much less trust in <laughs> scientists themselves. And especially if scientists work, for example, in corporations. Um, then you have a large group, the largest group actually, is passive supporters. 
they are not that interested in science. They actually, they think, well, yeah, it's kind of important and it should be funded by the state, of course. And I trust what they, I'm pretty sure they know what they do. But at the same time, it doesn't really affect me all that much. It doesn't really have all that much to do with my life. And you have the disengaged, who are the most critical group and who have most concerns about science. And if you actually look at the media diets that these different groups have, and they differ as well. These two groups, they use broad sets of media, journalistic media, social media, um, not only Swiss media, but also international media, online, etc. So they have a broad media diet, if you like. Uh, and they also speak about science with, in, their, in their social environment, with their peers and their families and friends. Etc. <coughs> and they search for information about science. The passive supporters don't search for information about science. If they come across science, then it's because in their, in their routine media use, every day using, uh, reading the newspaper, watching the evening news, every now and then they come across science there. And that's that. And if, if it's in there, then they see something about science, but they wouldn't look for it. And they actually, they are not interested. And the only media, or the main media that they actually use to get in contact with science is the commercial television and Facebook. So you have differences in trust and in attitudes towards science, and you have very different media diets. And one of the challenges, uh, for example, is that most of what we do actually in science communication, practical science communication, somehow addresses rather these groups than these groups which would potentially be more worthwhile, I think. But uh, maybe that's something for the discussion. Third challenge, the balance of power in science communication is shifting. And the question is, well, who will provide orientation uh, in the future? The balance of power is shifting means there's a flood of information available. People can have online sources available where they could potentially uh, get information about science. Uh, all the way to repositories where they could actually, with one or two clicks, access scientific papers themselves. And at the same time, the traditional institutions that have provided orientation there, journalists, are eroding. And there, have been, there has been quite a discussion about the question of, well, isn't, isn't the balance of power shifting in the, in the sense that we have less journalists? We have less uh, 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 power, so to speak, in journalism. We have the weakness of science journalism. On the other hand, we have an increasing strength of PR and of marketing, including, as I, as I tried to show you, from universities. And the question is, well, what does this lead to? Well, there's a very nice, nice uh, study on medical issues, actually, by Patrick Sumner and colleagues who have tried to figure out, well, how does this balance of power actually look like? And what they did is they took three kinds of texts. They had scientific papers, they had press releases about these scientific papers that were written by, by the press officers in the institutions where these scientific papers had been produced, and they had media coverage about these scientific papers. So these three kinds of texts. And then they compared one to the other. And if you only look at the article, the, the scientific article, the journal article itself, and the media coverage, then you would see, in many cases, well, okay, the media coverage is exaggerated. It's sensationalizing. It's applying findings that were actually derived from experiments with mice and suggests that they are immediately relevant for humans and all that. So you would say, well, okay, yeah, journalists are exaggerated, as usual. But if you actually look at the middle category, at the press releases from the scientific institutions, from the universities, etc., you see that most of the exaggerations are actually built in there. They're built in there, and the journalists don't don't exaggerate uh, uh, actually much more. So the most, the, the strongest part uh, in terms of exaggeration, at least in this field, actually come uh, come into it in the institutions. Okay, relatedly, the fourth challenge. Um, Credibility judgments. We have this flood of information. Um, and that means that credibility judgments about science content get more difficult for many non-scientists. Especially if people are not all that interested in science, they use cognitive shortcuts, 
heuristics to actually judge the credibility of uh, uh, scientific issues. Things like, but is there, is there somebody from the university there? Do they have quantitative data? Do they have numbers in essence? Do, does, he, does she have an, an academic title and all that? Um, or does the actual article come from a credible source like, I don't know, The Guardian or The Times or the BBC? But the thing is that in online contexts, often, A, these, these cues for these heuristics are less visible or less well perceived. Many people perceive the cues that are provided, like who's actually the, the medium that's the source of this Facebook post, that's less well perceived than the actual that, uh, the, the platform that it comes from. Um, so that's the first kind of challenge. And B, there's additional cues on social media. There's things like comments and likes and shares, and they further blur the credibility judgments that are there. Again, a study that has tried to analyze this from, from American colleagues about the nasty, that's what they call the nasty effect. The question was, if we confront people with a piece of science journalism on social media, and the only thing we vary in the experiment is the kind of comments that are under this article. The article is always the same. Do the comments actually influence how the article and the underlying science are perceived? And what they found out, for example, is that incivility, how they call it, so the incivility of the language in the, in the comments under the article pretty strongly influence how not only the article is judged, but the science itself described in the article. So these additional cues, these social media cues that are, that are prevalent there, influence how people uh, 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 perceive um, the actual, not only the coverage, but the actual science. Okay, and only shortly, three more challenges without, without too many examples. Um, I think generally we need more good science communication. And that's more of a challenge potentially for the praxis of science communication. I don't think we need more necessarily. We need more good science communication. And to do that, we need more training in this field. And we need more incentives also for scientists to actually engage in science communication. Because so far, the system of science is only marginally geared towards actually incentivizing people to actually communicate with their science. But if we want good or more good science communication, the question, of course, is well, what's good? Then? What's the criterion for judging what is good or what is high quality science communication? And that, of course, is a normative question. That's a question where we need a debate or more of a debate within the scientific community about the question, well, what can, what should, what are we allowed to do? What, what could be the normative basis of science communication? There's, that debate has started. There's different fora and papers where, where people have actually tried to develop models of good science communication, like the honest broker model that you see here by Roger Pilke, who tries to strengthen uh, 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 scientific institutions as intermediaries between stakeholders uh, and science, that, that, uh, that he calls honest brokers. But the question is, essentially, well, what's the appropriate role of science? of science communication? Is it to persuade an audience to accept views about science? Or is it to clarify understandings and engage a wider public in a more vigorous debate? <coughs> so essentially, what I introduced earlier on as a way of, of more participation and more dialogue. And last part, I think for many fields, we, need, we simply need more research on science communication as well. And more research also beyond the countries and the disciplines where we have quite a lot of research uh, already. Um, with this nice quote by Dominic uh, Fossard, uh, social scientists are only beginning to understand how audiences uh, uh, sense of complex scientific issues. That's it for me. Thank you for your patience. And uh, I'm happy to try to answer questions.